Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as you know, Raji Sarani uh, is not able to be with us this afternoon. However, Jean Mira, a labor lawyer from New York who is president of the International Association of Democratic Lawyers and who has just returned from Gaza, will be making a presentation uh, on behalf of uh, Raji and behalf of herself. So I'll ask uh, Jean to come to the podium. Where is she? Thank you very much, members of the jury, distinguished members of the jury. As uh, uh, I was introduced, I am Jeannie Myra. I am uh, president of the International Association of Democratic Lawyers, which is we refer to as IADL. Raji Sarani asked that I make this presentation today on his behalf, and he's sorry he cannot be with us. In addition to all of his work in the occupied Palestinian territories, as a director general of the Palestinian Center for Human Rights, Raji Sarani is a vice president of the International Federation of Human Rights, FIDH, president of the Board of Trustees of the Arab Organization for Human Rights, a member of the International Commission of Jurists, and most importantly for us, a member of the executive committee or bureau of the International Association of Democratic Lawyers. IADL was founded in 1946 um, to bring together progressive lawyers from around the world to implement the goals of the UN Charter, including peaceful resolutions of disputes, uh, international disputes, economic, promote economic and social justice, human rights, independent judiciaries, and accountability for violations of the UN Charter, international humanitarian law, and human rights law. In the United States, the IADL's affiliates are the National Lawyers Guild, and the National Conference of Black Lawyers. I am co-chair of the Inter International Committee of the National Lawyers Guild. The IADL has supported the, the rights of the, the cause of the Palestinian people since 1948. We decided last year to hold this year's fall executive committee meeting in Gaza, which Raji was able to arrange. We therefore were in Gaza from September 24th to 28th uh, of 2012. My information from the trip is therefore very fresh, and although in those five days we held two days of executive committee meetings, a one-day seminar on, called Setting the Agenda, Accountability for International Law Violations in the Occupied Palestinian Territory, Raji arranged for us to meet with members of the Palestinian Bar Association, members of human rights organizations, the network of Palestinian NGOs, many representatives of women's organizations, the Union of Fishermen, as well as UNRWA, international, other international and non-governmental, international governmental and non-governmental organizations, such as World Health Organization, UNICEF, and the International Committee of the Red Cross. We also held meetings with representatives of all the political factions, the, prime, the, very, the various government officials, including the, the Justice Minister and the, and the Prime Minister. On Saturday, the 29th of September, as we left, we held a press conference and issued what we called the Gaza Declaration. It's currently on the Palestinian Center for Human Rights website. It will be circulated soon. I believe I have given every member of the panel a copy of it. But let me try to give you a flavor and channel Raji as best I can and give you a flavor of the case of Gaza. Gaza is a small section of land whose north coast is the Mediterranean Sea. It is completely surrounded by Israel on the east and south and shares a border with uh, Egypt on the west. It is 360 square kilometers, about 140 square kilometers, and currently has a population of 1.6 million. It is considered the most densely populated section of land on, on Earth. To say that it is an open-air prison for 1.6 million people is not an exaggeration. 
While most people are familiar with the absolute closure imposed on Gaza in, in 2007, since the beginning of the occupation in 1967, there have been various forms of closure and restrictions on the people in the occupied Palestinian territories. As noted in the PCHR publication entitled, Illegal Closure of the Gaza Strip, Collective Punishment of the Civilian Population, issued in December of 2010, the, two, the people of Gaza have been subject to various levels of closure since the beginning of the occupation in 1967. The general closure, which was the least restrictive, allowed Israel to control the movement of people in the occupied territories, but some goods and people were allowed into and out of Gaza, including people going to jobs in Israel. This was followed by a strict closure, which allowed very minimal or very little movement and only of a humanitarian nature. And this, has, this was applied more frequently after 1981 until troops were deployed in Gaza in 1994. The absolute closure has been imposed since 2007 and is the most restrictive. Despite the easing after the attack on the flotilla in May 2010, the movement of people in and out of Gaza is severely restricted. Goods are strictly controlled by Israel at the Karim Shalom crossing and limited to a small number of foodstuffs and approved construction materials. Were it not for the tunnels being built from Gaza to Egypt in the last period, which the Egyptians are often pressured to destroy and close, the humanitarian crisis in Gaza would be so much worse than I am going to describe. But first I want to emphasize that not only is the belligerent occupation of Gaza, both Gaza and the West Bank for over 45 years illegal, and not only was the bombardment and invasion of Gaza in illegal in Israel, by Israel in Operation Cast Ledge, which lasted from December 27, 2008 to January 19, 2009, an illegal war of aggression, there can be no doubt but the closures imposed on Gaza are illegal collective punishment and have been found so not only by organizations such as PCHR, IADL, and many others, but many others, including the International Committee of the Red Cross. Consider the following. Article 33 of the Fourth Geneva Convention states, no protected person may be punished for an offense he has not personally committed. Collective penalties and likewise all measures of intimidation, of, uh, intimidation or of terrorism are permitted. Article 50. Uh, of the Hague Convention states, no general penalty, pecuniary or otherwise, shall be inflicted upon the population on account of acts of individuals for which they cannot be jointly or severally responsible. The same principle is enshrined in the first <clears throat> additional protocol to the Geneva Convention of 1977, which is considered customary international law. It is also a fundamental principle of criminal law that no, sh no one shall be punished for an offense committed by others. With all of these controls that Israel has over the people of Gaza, there is no question that Gaza remains occupied and the obligations to Israel, of Israel to the people of Gaza as an occupying power as, requested by the, as required by the Fourth Geneva Convention is to ensure that the fundamental rights and needs, to ensure the fundamental rights and needs of the civilian population. Only Israel claims it no longer occupies Gaza. In a friendly decision from the Israeli High Court that, that after the troop redeployment in 2005, the court held that it had no effective control over Gaza, limiting Israel's duties to the people of Gaza to quote, the prevention of humanitarian crisis. This decision flies in the face of the reality where every day Israelis control every aspect of the life of people in Gaza. What is the reality in Gaza today as a result of the occupation and closure? Although I will be stating some statistics, there is no way to convey the situation in Gaza using such facts and figures. What has to be kept in mind is that the occupation and the absolute closure is an ongoing attack on the human dignity of the people in Gaza. In, part in particular, and all Palestinians generally. It is a systematic degradation, humiliation, 
isolation and fragmentation of the Palestinian people. It separates families as there is no travel between the West Bank and Gaza. The economic dependency reinforces an ongoing humanitarian crisis, crises so as to promote divisions and so as to disrupt the emergence of a Palestinian state. In its report, PCHR states, the economic impact of the prolonged illegal closure of Gaza is pervasive. It has paralyzed all economic sectors and resulted in the emergence of a man-made, completely preventable humanitarian crisis. The restrictions on the movements of goods into and out of the Gaza Strip has meant that the industrial sector in Gaza is no longer able to obtain raw materials needed to make its products and, pro and producers can no longer export their goods to markets in the rest of the occupied Palestinian territories or abroad. These restrictions on the movement of people has meant that thousands of Palestinians who once worked alongside Israelis in Israel can no longer have access to their jobs and have since become unemployed with the evident implications for poverty and dependency rates. The fishing industry, for which Gaza is famous and which previously employed a large segment of the population, is being wiped out as it is forced, to increasingly, forced into increasingly uh, small fishing area by Israeli gunships, which frequently fire at and wound and kill Palestinian fishermen and confiscate, confiscate fishing boats and equipment. The unilateral imposition of a buffer zone around all the borders of the Gaza Strip and Israel, which is a no-go zone area that extends at least 300 meters and sometimes 2,000 meters into Palestinian land, is cutting off access to, most, to almost to more than 35% of agricultural lands. More statistics, 95% of the 3,900 industrial establishments in Gaza have closed or have suspended their work due to restrictions placed on the import of raw materials or inability to export their products. The remaining 5% work at 20 to 50% of capacity. 45 to 50% of the people in Gaza are unemployed and 67% are considered to live in deep poverty. 1.1 million people are reliant on food assistance in order to meet their daily caloric needs. In August 2012, the UN country team in occupied Palestinian territory issued a report entitled, Gaza in 2020, a livable place? Question mark. In this report, the UN predicts that the population of Gaza will be 2.13 million by 2020. The water demands will increase but the aquifer will likely become unusable by 2016 and the damage to it irreversible by 2020. There is a need for 250 additional schools at the present time and another 190 by 2020 to maintain current inadequate but inadequate levels of health care. There will be a need for 1,000 more doctors, 2,000 more nurses, and 800 more hospital beds by 2020. More than 71,000 housing units are needed now to address the crisis from cast lead, and many more will be needed by 2020 to address the increase in population. 93% of Gaza's power is dependent on fuel from Israel to Gaza power plant. The damage to the grid from cast lead and the unstable receipt of fuel from Israel has resulted in daily power cuts to most of Gaza. These cuts last from 8 to 12 hours a day. By 2020, the demand for power will double, but there, was no, there is no way under current conditions that the people of Gaza will be able to fix the current grid, find new sources of renewable energy, or explore the gas reserves of the Gaza Marine offshore gas field in time. Access to water is at a critical stage. As highlighted in the report of the World Bank and the UN Environmental Program, the situation in relation to water and sanitation for the Palestinians of Gaza is critical. With no perennial streams and low rainfall, Gaza relies almost completely on an underlying coastal aquifer, which is partly replenished by rainfall 
and runoff from the Hebron Hills to the east with the recharge of, a, of estimated at 50 to 60 million cubic meters annually. Current abstraction of water from the aquifer is at an estimated 160 million cubic meters per year to meet the overall demand, and that is well beyond the replenishment of water. As the groundwater levels subsequently decline, seawater infiltrates from the Mediterranean Sea. The salinity of the water in Gaza is not safe to drink, and this is, and this is compounded by the contamination of the aquifer by nitrates from uncontrolled and untreated sewage. 90,000 cubic meters of untreated sewage is dumped into the sea each day due to the already inadequate treatment facilities and the inability to build enough plants to quickly, uh, plants quickly due to the closure and lack of resources. The UNEP, United Nations Environmental Program, states that in order to prevent complete damage to the aquifer by 2016, which at this time will take decades to recover, and its total destruction by 2020, which, which will take centuries to recover, the abstraction of water from the aquifer must stop now. Sources of water must be inter internationally provided, while water desalinization and waste water treatment plants can be built. Our meeting with the UNRWA representatives highlighted how impossible it is under current condition for the UN agencies to actually build the schools and hospitals infrastructure necessary for meeting the needs of the people of Gaza. While officially Israel does not have the right to dis disapprove a project, once, a project has been once the project has received approval of the Palestinian authorities, the Israelis have the effective control because they will break down the plans into their component parts for construction materials and only let the precise amount they determine necessary for the project to be carried through the Karam Sh Shalom crossing. The UN is also required to hire guards to protect these products to ensure they are not stolen. In this manner, many projects that should take a year to plan and complete sometimes take five to 10 years, depending on resources. Applying this to the crisis and access of water for the full population of Gaza, we came to the conclusion that in the absence of resources of the Palestinians themselves, due to the occupation and closure to address the water crisis, if massive investments are in water treatment and desalinization plants are not taken immediately, the whole population of Gaza will be subject to a water crisis of genocidal proportions in a very few years. I want to mention also before turning to the issue of impunity what, and what we should do, that the situation in the, of the Palestinian fishermen in Gaza is critical and impacts the food supply. The waters close to the Mediterranean shore the Mediterranean Sea are shallow. The fishermen told us that in order to really catch anything substantial, the boats need to go out at least six miles. But since the absolute closure, Israelis have hemmed fishermen in uh, supposedly to three miles, but it's not really three miles. During the last day we were in Gaza, two fishermen were fired upon by Israeli gunships, and they were only 1.5 miles off the shore. One of the fishermen was wounded, and one of them died the day after we left. There is no justification for this type of attack and killing. I want to make one final point on the occupation and closure, closure. The international community is, in effect, subsidizing the occupation and closure. The amount of money it takes to keep the closure in place and Israel's refusal to acknowledge its duties under the Fourth Geneva Convention has meant that through UNRWA, which is also dependent on private as well as international community do donations, must fill the gap. The international community is thereby subsidizing these illegal acts <laughs> uh, so as to provide the barest of necessity of food and shelter and education to the people of Gaza. Although this aid is a matter of life and death for the people of Gaza, and, and, and in the refugee camps. It would be much better if the people in Gaza were able to use their talents to build their country and not be dependent on the world for aid. As lawyers, we have been taught that where there is a wrong, there must be a remedy. In fact, the duty to punish countries that engage in wars of aggression is codified in the Nuremberg Principles. 
The duty to punish grave breaches of the international humanitarian law are stated in the Geneva Conventions themselves. Indeed, Article 146 of the Fourth Geneva Convention requires the high contracting parties to enact legislation to provide effective penal sanctions for persons committing or ordering to be committed any grave breaches of the Fourth Geneva Convention itself. Articles 85 and 86.1 of Protocol 1 of the Geneva Convention of 1977 require the repression of grave breaches and for countries to take measures to suppress all grave breaches, breaches which result from a failure to act when there is a duty to do so. Many of these Ill illegal actions are codified <coughs> as war crimes under the Rome Statute, which created the International Criminal Court. Similarly, the right to an effective remedy for violations of internationally recognized human rights, which include the denial of access to employment, education, water, health care, food, housing, are enshrined in many international instruments. These include Article 8 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 2.3 2 .3 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Article 6 of the International Covenant, International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, Article 14 of the Convention Against Torture and Other Cruel, Inhuman and Degrading Treatment or Punishment, just to name a few. There is no lack of law uh, on which to prosecute or demand a remedy from the Israelis for the actions of the Israelis in Gaza. The issue is political will. The Palestinian Center for Human Rights investigated hundreds of cases of violations of international law, humanitarian law, during Operation Cast Lead, and has presented them to Israeli authorities. Thus far, there have been three prosecutions for such things as credit card theft, people carrying white flags being shot at, and sen sentences for the people who have been found guilty are, have been de minimis. While the Goldstone Report, which was the first substantive active action of the international community through the Human Rights Council to investigate the crimes during Cast Lead, found some violations by the government of Gaza for allowing rockets to be fired upon civ civilian populations in Israel, the findings with respect to Israeli actions were most damning and required action. The problem is, however, that Israel has been hiding behind its defenders in in the United States and NATO countries to prevent the Goldstone Report, prevent action on the Goldstone Report. The action suggested was that if either party failed to actually investigate itself and take action against the perpetrators, the matter should be referred to the International Criminal Court. This action has been stalled by the UN. Pressure was placed on Gold, Goldstone to renounce some of his findings. The efforts by the Palestinian Authority in the past to get the prosecutor of the, inter the prosecution prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, Mr. Ocampo, to accept the charges against Israel filed with the ICC and to open investigation have thus far proved futile, as the prosecutor last April stated he could not investigate the crimes as the Palest Palestinian Authority was not a state and could not therefore could not accede to the Rome Statute. We do not know what will happen if the Palestinians are successful in achieving observer state status at the UN and if that will make a difference to the new prosecutor. But it is clear there is pressure on the court not to investigate this, these crimes. Indeed, Israel makes the case that if Israel is prosecuted for its crimes in cast lead or ongoing occupation and closure, then the United States and NATO are responsible for their actions in Afghanistan and Iraq, not to mention ongoing drone strikes resulting in targeted killings in Yemen and, and Somalia, Pakistan, etc. Lawyers around the world have tried to address this impunity by using the concept of universal jurisdiction, the concept that some crimes are so heinous that every country has a duty to investigate and prosecute them regardless of whether they took place on their soil. This was the basis of the prosecution of Pinochet, Augusto Pinochet in Spain and England 30 years after he was out of power. In fact, the greatest lesson we must learn from the impunity which exists now with now, which is being promoted by the United States, is that undermining a rules-based international law system has consequences well beyond the immediate battle. How can the U.S. or any country, 
or any other country object to violations of the Nuremberg principles regarding crimes against peace or the UN Charter, which forbid the use of use or threat of the use of force in international disputes when it has violated those very same principles themselves. How can the U.S. have the moral authority to tell parties to not the ongoing civil war in Syria to stop killing civilians when they reserve to themselves the right to do the same and expect immunity from accountability? The international community has responded to genocidal actions in the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda with ad hoc tribunals and, with, and, and there have been special courts in Sierra Leone and Cambodia and elsewhere to address war crimes. But the point of the ICC was to make sure, the point of the International Criminal Court was to make sure that a country did not have to resort to such, that the international community did not have to resort to such ad hoc members, measures. The problem is the court was deemed optional for states to join. There, this is a problem. <laughs> the law to be applied is public law. But as of now, perpetrators have to agree to be tried to come within the, its jurisdiction. And though, although its jurisdiction is not to be invoked until there is a failure by the country to take actions itself, the concept of the court needs to be changed so that all states are subject to its jurisdiction on the principle that criminals do not enjoy immunity from prosecution unless they have entered into a contract with the prosecution, allowing themselves to be prosecuted. <laughs> the IADL issued a white paper on cast lead uh, right after it was ended in, in 2009. The paper was entitled Legal Issues Implicated in Cast Lead and suggested that if all else fails, the international community should through the General Assembly, explore the creation of a subsidiary body under Article 22 of the UN Charter to investigate the crimes and consequence of these crimes by the General Assembly itself. Impunity is not to be tolerated. We must fight on. We must use our creativity and all our tools to establish the respect for the rule of law in which nations understand that might does not make right, but rather it is right which makes might. This tribunal has an important role in making the moral and legal case for accountability and reparation. I thank you for the opportunity to present the case of Gaza. Thank you. What? Uh, thank you very much, Sir Jean. Uh, I'm afraid we are now into injury time, but uh, Michael Mansfield does have a question on universal jurisdiction. Yeah, well, Gaza couldn't be a bigger injury, could it? So this is. Sorry, yeah, can you hear? Fine. There are, there are two related issues here which I think need to be expanded if we're thinking about where we go from here. You touched upon the issue of universal jurisdiction, uh, by which it is meant that it doesn't matter who you are, where you are, or what you've done, you can be prosecuted anywhere. And all countries have an obligation internationally to ensure that they have domestic legislation enabling them to investigate and prosecute. I raise this because in the United Kingdom there have been several attempts, one nearly very successful, to arrest perpetrators under this universal jurisdiction. In one case, uh, the gentleman concerned actually arrived on a Heathrow runway. But the British police suddenly, they don't do this in other circumstances, ha had qualms about what they could do because he wouldn't get off the plane. <laughs> uh, usually they have a lot of interesting and imaginative tools at their disposal, one of which is you don't let the plane take off and you don't let any food or water onto the plane. I think he'd have to get off, but they didn't think of that. <laughs> However, I mention this because in the wake of these attempts, the British government apologized to the Israeli authorities that these, and they're now, we're now called law mongers, for these lawmongers' attempts. And then what they did was they changed the law in the United Kingdom by which if anyone wants to attempt to arrest 
a perpetrator entering the jurisdiction, and of course information comes in advance in most cases, they're going to have to go and get the permission of the government in the guise of the Attorney General, which means that it's going to be virtually impossible to get a, a prosecution. So th there's a battle to be fought on that front. That's the universal jurisdiction point that I want to make. It's extremely important because the wall judgment was really saying there are some crimes that are so serious, so heinous, it doesn't matter where they're committed, they've got to be, right. as it were, made accountable and punished. That's one thing. The sec sorry, they're a bit long. The second one, but I think Gaza is a very good illustration. Goldstone says, I know there are certain qualifications to what he said, but one of the things he said was effectively, this matter should be referred to the International Criminal Court. Court right. However, your other point is that Israel isn't signed up to this. So exactly what was going to happen at the International Criminal Court had they referred it there? And of course, the Security Council has the right to refer a case to the International Criminal Court. But if Israel isn't signed up, what's going to happen? So these are the two areas. I'm sorry, they're rather complicated. No, I mean, those are the perfect questions that we've all been struggling with, which is why I sort of fell back on the Article 22 subsidiary <laughs> charter, because if we can't get that, if we can't, it seems like there's every avenue to the International Criminal Court is being blocked. And every time, even in Belgium and Spain, every time there's an attempt to prosecute people, the laws get changed. There's pressure brought to bear on the governments to change the law. And so, in principle, we could go anywhere, even if they didn't have a law on, on uh, universal jurisdiction, on the principles of universal jurisdiction. But nonetheless, uh, you've asked that question I've been asking myself this, these questions, how do we deal with this? The only thing I can say is at some point there, if we're gonna have an international criminal court hold people accountable, if their own countries won't do it, it can't be based on uh, the law of contract where right. you agree to be prosecuted. It has to be considered so substantial that everybody in the world is bound by the Rome Statute. Now, how we get there, I don't know. Maybe our, an Article 22 subsidiary body of organ of the UN could make that proclamation. I don't know. All I know is that at this point, we have to find, we have to use our, our collective um, efforts, whether it's that in conjunction with BDS, that in conjunction with other efforts to isolate Israel, other efforts to bring, I mean, the US is, the fact that the, that the U.S. hides behind, I mean, see, Israel hides behind the fact that if you, if you take us to court, you know, you're responsible for Iraq and Afghanistan and, and all these other places that you've demolished. Hmm. And the U.S. doesn't want that on its head. I mean, I'd certainly love it because accountability is, <laughs> accountability is accountability. <laughs> so anyway, that's, those, you've asked the right questions. But... The reality is that unless people start saying, you know, stop saying, oh, this is bad, it's not a good thing, it's not politically wise, and say this is really illegal, <laughs> you know, unless we, uh, a body with your moral stature, you know, find this way, you know, we, we won't have the tools. But I think it's an important issue in your verdict to point out. Okay. That's all I'm saying. Can I recommend the uh, this second Russell report? should be available here. We deal with Gaza and classify it as a crime of persecution. Exactly. Thank you. Any other questions? Is there? Yeah, I got a question. Uh, yes. Um, you know, when you were uh, describing all of the, the, the reserves, the oil reserves and the water supply and other resources, and the bulldozing, or not bulldozing. I thought you were talking about one of our reservations. <laughs> uh, talking about Indian country where treaties, uh, once they found oil, uh, we had to move. Once they found gold, we had to move again. Other natural resources uh, really dictated where we ended up at. And and so I, I feel that um, 
how much gas or, or oil is, uh, is, there, is there offshore drilling? Um, there's a, there's a, a, a gas field out there. I don't know how much it's been explored, but it is known to be there. It's called the Marina Gaza gas field. So it, it, is, it is there. Uh, I know that the Israelis don't want the Gazas, the people, the Palestinians to have control over it. That's pretty obvious. I mean, from my history, I can see where, uh, what Israel is, is looking at down the future, down the road, maybe 50, 30, 60 years ago, from now, what they're looking at. And I think that we have to take that into consideration as we, as we deliberate. Thank you. I have a question. Yes, yes I um, I, I have read the um, report from the International Association of Democratic Lawyers, and um, actually it's one question maybe in two parts. And the first part would be you mentioned the Israeli actions not only constitute illegal co collective punishment, but are a precursor to genocide. So um, my question is, has this organization found uh, genocidal actions or the, the, the crime of genocide um, as having been present in the treatment of the Palestinians? That's the first part. The second part of my question is about this idea that is being floated of sociocide. Right. And I have um, used the word patricide in the idea of the complete destruction oh, of a land. Right. So uh, what is the IADL's position on sociocide as well? I don't think we currently have a position on sociocide, but I think we will definitely, I mean, I think the to the extent I understand the concept, we probably would agree with it, that it is happening. I mean, the precursor to genocide really relates to the, the water. I mean, you cannot live without water. And the aquifer is, is, complete, is about to be completely uh, destroyed. Where are those people going to live? I mean, if this, isn't, if this isn't genocide, it's certainly a crime against humanity. But you also have the use of the depleted uranium which doesn't go away. Absolutely. And some people say it's not actually depleted, but it was actually regular uranium. That's right, uh -huh. yes. One last question. Any other? I don't actually have a question. I just wanted to thank you for bringing us, actually for first going there and witnessing and being there and seeing and hearing and knowing and then coming back to us with so much passion and compassion. This is a wonderful gift to us, and we really appreciate it. Thank, thank you, but I have to tell you, I, can't, I, I see Gaza in my head, and it's, it's hard not to want to trumpet what's happening. Thank you. Well, I, I just want to pick up, and it's just one sentence. Uh, thanks for the very wonderful way you've presented this, and your reference to the water issue of genocidal proportions, the question that Cynthia McKinney has raised. The point is that what you're showing is that there's a slow death of a people taking place in Gaza, and certainly in the West Bank as well, although at present, because of the siege, the slow death of a people is taking place there more rapidly. And I would say that raises the question of genocide, which needs to be examined. So thank you for your, your reference. Thank you. Thank may, you. May I join others in thanking you very much for coming to speak to us at this last minute uh, with so little notice. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's better. You must try not to clap. <laughs> but we will, we will reach at one moment. So, tell me, now you see that uh, we ended this first day of uh, work of the Russell Tribunal on Palestine. 
and that uh, you will be convened tomorrow morning to be with us at uh, 10 o'clock we will start so that you must uh, try to be a little bit earlier uh, the door will be open at 9 because you know that there are this control and we need to have this control and uh, we will tomorrow uh, start with the role of the US in the supporting the violation of the Palestinian rights so that I wish you a uh, nice evening and good night until tomorrow morning. Thank you to all of you. And uh, I ask you to stay, stand up, please, so that the jury can now leave the room.